Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to PMF IS Current Affair Prelims Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and in this particular video, we would be discussing the second part of the test number six, where I'll be discussing questions from twenty one to forty. I really hope that you have enjoyed the first part and you have learned a lot of things. And uh, I'm sure that you are enjoying this test series. If you if you are actually learning something from this test series, then do let us know in the comment section box your feedback. about this particular test series and also if you are interested to practice these questions live then you can also avail the entire test series in at a just rupees of 499 which is a very uh, special price but of course for a limited time so you can get and check out the test series at 499 and the link is given in the comment section box do try it for your prelims uh, 2024 this question number 21 which was asked uh this question is with respect to the north east council now it's a very important question because in india we have interstate councils and uh, there are multiple such councils which the government has made uh, some are based out of constitution some are not constitutional some are statutory in nature and but when it comes to north east council there are certain things that you should be aware of i hope this question was not that tough for many of you but how you should be attempting this question please try to learn uh, the north eastern council is a nodal agency that we have assigned for the, the ministry of development for the north eastern region you know before like like a couple of years back there was no dedicated ministry for the north eastern region but now thankfully for the development and upliftment of the north eastern states of india the seven sisters and their one brother sikkim we have got a dedicated ministry and this council now is working as a nodal agency and because of that this council has right now it has become even more relevant for the development of the north eastern india now this is this particular uh, north eastern council was not the part of the original constitution of course this was this was established as a statutory body uh, under the north east council act 1971 where the headquarters we have is in shillong when it comes to the member of north eastern uh, council you should be aware of the member as well so the members are the governors and the chief minister of all the eight states the seven sisters and the sikkim and of course when it comes to the chairman and the three members are also part of the member uh, those are nominated by the president of india so this composition is very important and you may have the question coming especially when whenever you are dealing with any of the councils you may have a question coming on the composition of the committees or councils so this particular part the structure part is becomes very very important so when you see here you will have the first statement as a wrong one is it a constitutional body no it is a it is a statutory body plus it was not created by in 1976 you know it is created in 1971 by north east council act so clearly the first statement can be eliminated now my take away is you please understand and try to learn it this way north eastern council of course we all know that it was not a part of the original constitution and 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 there is there has always been this allegations that the north eastern states are being ignored or there are allegations that you know we have, the government has not done enough for that uh, north east council so obviously this has to be a statutory body which was added later on so that also gives you a hint the first statement to be wrong the second is fine yes because you understand in without chief ministers and governors you cannot really form the council so second statement is correct in this way so this question was a very straight forward easy question could have been attempted easily and not just the north east council my recommendation to you is please try to read all such interstate councils interstate council topic itself is very very important and that has been asked by upsc in many many uh, previous year uh, exams so do read about interstate councils they are really important for you guys next question is a very straight forward question it says now there is a report and the report name is the policy toolkit for implementing life now please remember this particular concept life and i would say it's a star mark question for your prelims 2024 because the life concept number 1 given by mr modi from india and this life mission is actually being 
recognized globally by all all the global leaders and all the global bodies so you may have a question directly indirectly coming on the life initiative now when it comes to the policy toolkit for implementing life here the right answer is supposed to be b it is international energy agency so first we'll discuss and then we'll come back to the to the point so please remember this particular report it is done by iea international energy agency which is an autonomous intergovernmental organization which was established way back in 1974 with the headquarters in france paris okay now interestingly when i'm talking about the mission life which because this particular topic is again very relevant for your exam this is the initiative which is started by our ministry ministry of uh, environment forest climate change and mission life envisions replacing the use and dispose kind of economy and now we want to convert the economy as a circular economy circular economy means you are you are recycling and reusing the things you are not you are not creating waste you are not simply using it and dumping it it uh, that kind of economy is called linear economy where you are using dumping using dumping a lot of waste is being created circular economy is when you are when you are using something then you are recycling reusing it that is a kind of circular economy so mission life which is the initiative of uh, ministry of environment is about the circular economy now try to remember this fact as well this is important now you can think if you if you know that okay this is circular economy so then you can think that okay now for having a circular economy energy efficiency is the key right how you can ensure that i am having a circular economy for any circular economy the energy use energy efficiency is actually a very very important topic now here if you see this particular uh, this uh, this particular organization has the same objective of tracking analyzing the key global energy trends and promoting the sound energy and another policy good policies about energy use energy efficiency so that actually makes sense why a report on mission life is to be related to iea understand that now when you think of this mission life it is it 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 has also given a very interesting uh, name uh, it says that they are going to create a global network of p3 what is the p3 it is pro planet people so every individual who is following mission life who is trying to contribute towards the circular economy those people are called are going to be called as uh, earth friendly people means pro planet people right the core mission of this mission life is lifestyle if you elaborate uh, the full form it is it talks about the lifestyle for environment the life the word life means lifestyle for environment that is the full form of life so it talks about lifestyle of the planet for the planet and by the planet so that is the core principle do remember this also you never know you have a separate question coming on on life as well and this mission life uh, is now initially it has been started for like 6 years from 22 to 2028 if you go back now you can understand why this particular report has a relation to the international energy agency i am very very sure every option okay you can eliminate the food program food has nothing to do but i am very sure the option a and d they were equally confusing why because we have just understood mission life mission life is the initiative of ministry of environment so be very very careful i am not talking about the question is not about the mission life it's about the policy toolkit for implementing and this is the name of a report so i understand this question was tough it was tough because the options very confusing and when you have something related to environment of course there are chances that un environment program is somehow uh, be a part of that so that i understand this question was a tough one and given the level of confusion it is better to skip if you are not aware because i am very sure that you are last going to think about the iea most likely people will give the answer as a or d and i'm sure many of you must have given the answer as a and d so better to skip in this case and try to learn remember it for the upcoming prelims exam if by chance finger cross if that question comes then it becomes easy for you to the answer now question number 23 <clears throat> next question is about the mega food park scheme the mfps 
what is this mega food park scheme and which statement is correct that is something you have to talk about now please understand before i start anything before i talk about anything so just try to understand i'm talking about the food park scheme okay what do we do in food park food park is basically for the purpose of food processing right i'm sure everyone knows about it what what does a food park do it is all about the food processing please understand why would why would the mega food park scheme is to be related to ministry of agriculture ministry of agriculture is related to the agricultural activities not the food processing industry and and you know it very well that in india we have a dedicated ministry for food processing so by any chance there is no relation between the food park food processing and ministry of agriculture make sense so you can straight away say oh this ministry is given wrong and let me tell you 90% cases may you are going to find the ministry as a wrong ministry 90% so you really have to be careful whenever the ministries are given okay now let, let me take you to the scheme first and then we'll come back so we have just understood this particular scheme and it's not a new scheme either this is a very old scheme started in 2008 implemented by ministry of food processing industries and then please remember under this particular mega food park scheme the government of india provides 50% of the project cost in general areas and 70% uh, support is given by center for the north eastern states okay so clearly the the second option if you see is again not correct so yeah this is also incorrect it says 75 and 90 no it is 50 for general areas and 75 for the case of north eastern so first and second statements are absolutely incorrect <clears throat> so at least i am aware that okay fine two statements are wrong but try to learn something else from the uh, this particular uh, mega food park scheme so mega food park the mega food park scheme it's a component that we have started in 2008 under pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana this particular kisan sampada yojana is a central sector scheme and here the word sampada means scheme for agro marine processing the key word is processing and development of the agro again processing cl clusters and that's why it make every sense why we are putting it under ministry of food processing industries make sense to everyone guys so do remember that this mega food park is a component under pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana and you should also prepare do prepare this scheme as well because this scheme is going to continue to till, till 2026 so for the next 2 years there are every chance that there is a separate question coming on the pradhan mantri sampada yojana even if you remember the full form of sampada the things become really easy for you okay this is important and please remember for the implementation of this mega food park scheme special purpose vehicles are being created by the government but please remember for the implementation of this scheme in the states the state governments need not to form a separate special purpose vehicles uh, uh, special purpose vehicles are simply subsidiary companies created by the parent company so states don't have to create separate one the central government special purpose vehicles are enough to implement the scheme so now if you go back you are going to have only one statement as the correct one because first and second we already have ruled out and the fourth one says the state government is going to have a separate special purpose vehicle that is not the case now answer here is only and only one was the statement simple was the statement uh, was the question simple i would say yeah it was a tough one question was tough undoubtedly but it's not like that you you can't uh, make things work you you can still uh, take a little bit of risk by eliminating the obvious wrong ones like for example statement number 1 for example statement number 4 at least some statements could have been eliminated so risk can be taken in such cases where at least you have some scope to eliminate question number 24 that we have is about uh, okay again another question which is based on pradhan mantri formalization of the micro process micro food processing enterprises okay we'll take this question and let's try to understand and here also again before i get into the details look at this again if i have a scheme relate relating to micro food processing enterprise is it going to be under ministry of commerce again no we have a ministry of food processing itself 
so clearly my first statement is not correct at all this has to be wrong and look at the second statement where what it says so this micro food processing enterprise provides financial technical business support for setting up upgrading micro enterprise in the country obviously yes on a serious note i have absolutely no clue about this particular scheme but with my common sense i can still understand which ministry has to be there and what normally what what this kind of scheme supposed to be of course it is about it's a very general statement it this this is about supporting the and supporting and upgrading the micro food processing enterprise so here the answer is supposed to be b even without going into the details i still got my answer just to add on to that remember guys this pradhan mantri formalization of micro food processing enterprise scheme is a central sponsored scheme means the funding is not going to be alone by center funding is to be shared between center and the states and you have the ministry in front of you very obvious it is important and one star mark point that you have to remember is this scheme it is initiative under the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan to upgrade the self reliance in terms of food processing this scheme has been started okay okay i think everything is clear from this point okay when it comes to the objective so normally i told you that it is about supporting micro food processing how we are going to do that so there are certain aims like like uh, this particular scheme aims at enhancing the competitiveness of individual micro enterprises especially in the unorganized segments in the food processing we also want to promote formal as the name says because you know right now in india majority of the micro enterprises especially in 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 the food business food processing business they belong to unorganized sector unorganized is the informal sector of economy so and 90% of the workforce in india work in the unorganized sector and this sector largely do not pay much of the taxes right so the government is trying to promote the formalization of the sector food processing is largely operated as unorganized sector in india and that's why we really want to promote the formalization formalization it becomes more organized when it becomes more organized more people will be under tax bracket more workers will get the formal support uh, get all the benefits of, of you know which every worker is entitled so it's a win win situation whenever the things become formalized it's a win win situation for both ways right and uh, based on that and how we are going to do that so of course we are going to increase the access to the credit to these micro enterprise because for every micro enterprise to build up the capacity the real problem the real challenge is the capital so this by formalizing because once your sector become formalized then it becomes easy for you to get the credit especially from the banking sector and that's how that's why we we are interested in making things more formal here right that's how it is to be done but again i'm not going into the detail i i'm trying to make this point that with the with the sheer common sense i could have attempted this question very easily now i'm i'm discussing the detail that is a separate thing but i can still figure out my question though the question was tough but can still be figured out so right answer is supposed to be b here in this answer now that brings us to the question number 25 question 25 is very simple straight forward question talks about e shram portal if you know the meaning of e shram shram is basically worker who is a shramik shramik is the worker shramik means worker labor so e shram portal has to do something with the workers of india make sense yes so clearly e shram portal it is not about students it is not about researchers it is not about the softwares not at all about agriculture or technologies or something farmers nothing like that as the name says e shram portal it is about the workers so it is actually a national database and plus this is a very famous it's a very famous portal that is being created by government of india especially the need was felt during the uh, during the covid times where the migrant workers faced the challenges where we saw the disturbing pictures where thousands and thousands of workers they were moving to their native places and that to bare foot right that was a lockdown times in covid i'm sure uh, we all have we, we all still have uh, those pictures fresh in our head now e shram portal is basically a national database 
of the unorganized workers in and that to make it more comprehensive this database includes every type of workers very interestingly the workers migrant workers are included construction workers even the gig workers and platform workers which again is the latest phenomena it's a latest category of the of the workers that we have in our country so here the answer is supposed to be a and this is very easy easy to attempt because other options are also easy to eliminate all you need is a common sense all you need is a is a presence of mind there now to to tell you a little bit more about the ishram portal let me tell you this portal is the first ever national database that we are we are creating and the major target is to get the database of the unorganized sector why sir organized sector data is already there with the government it the real challenge to get the data is is of the unorganized sector the informal sector and you know 90% i just told you 90% workers in india they actually work in in, in the unorganized sector and that's why uh, many times they are not eligible or they don't get access to the benefits of the government schemes so first of all the very first basic if you really want to benefit the workers the first task is to get their details at one single platform and for that purpose we got the ishram portal it is now we're talking about the workers okay we're talking about the labors of the country so which ministry has to be there ministry of labor employment very obvious this is important right now this uh, uh, this particular ishram portal has the objective of creating comprehensive national database of the unorganized sector also improving the implementation efficiency of the social security services because once you have the data then then the government will be in a position to better deliver the social security services to the unorganized sectors so in order to enhance the social security in order to give them more welfare benefits this kind of portal was started okay and very interestingly when when you when you talk about the features of this kind of portal uh, please remember even 2 lakh rupees accidental insurance cover is also being given in the ishram if you are registered if you are registered in this portal and if by chance during your work if any accident happens so 2 lakh rupees up to 2 lakh rupees the accident insurance cover is also there so you really need to for every worker it is good to be registered on the ishram portal okay and every registered uh, worker will get a unique universal account number uh, that is also one of the features of the ishram portals now that takes us to the question number 26 now this question 26 is about the ramp program what is this ramp program ramp means raising and accelerating the msme performance sometimes the names are enough the name says a lot itself so this particular scheme this particular program is all about accelerating the performance of micro small medium enterprises of our country okay now very interestingly look at look at the uh, look at the statement look at the options here well the second statement looks very much fine because you know we have a ministry of msme and of course when it comes to improving the performance of micro small medium enterprises the ministry looks perfectly fine in general let me tell you this the the question says that this scheme um is having the assistance by imf which is international monetary fund so the scheme is the imf assisted program aiming to improve the performance but my question is how many times you have seen if you compare imf and world bank you know world bank is more active when it comes to these kind of program world world bank is more collaborating with the countries imf do not really really uh get into the schemes directly much so if you if you have 10 schemes for example you will have only one or two by imf rather eight or nine schemes will be in collaboration with the world bank world bank is more proactive in this case and here also the ramp program is not assisted by imf it is assisted by world bank and that makes my first statement as wrong second being correct so very straight forward question easy question easy to attempt the answer is supposed to be b okay ministry absolutely has no problem just to tell you a little bit more detail about the program the ramp program which is a world bank assisted program is about improving the performance of the msmes and my suggestion okay one more thing let me give you one tip here 
my tip is please read about the latest definitions of the msmes government of india few years back have changed the definitions of the msmes please read the latest definition what which particular uh, company is considered to be micro which is small which is macro so try to learn about these micro small medium enterprises and read about the latest definitions you never know you may have a question like a match the following kind of question so do read about the latest definition as well okay now this this ramp scheme overall if you see this is an important component uh, and uh, uh, this ramp scheme has one important component as strategic investment plans and that is to be done in order to mobilize the msmes identifying the sectors and then giving some specific budgets for the requirement of interventions that is the way the world bank is assisting and accelerating or trying to accelerate the msmes that is what it is now if you look at the objectives why the, what this uh, what are the objective of the scheme objectives are improving access to market and credit because again msmes has a one basic problem and that is the crunch of the capital because these msmes are again largely of large maximum number of msmes are still unorganized sector so the real challenge is to expand and for that we you need to have the capital but this program this scheme is going to help uh, getting the msmes the required market and the credits also improving the center stage state linkages partnership also greening of msmes greening ma means making them more eco friendly making their process more eco friendly less carbon emissions and more technology upgradation because right now in the country majority of the msmes are are also again because of lack of capital they are actually suffering from the obsolete technology that they are using and in order to accelerate their progress of course they have to uh, uh, integrate themselves with the latest technologies and that is where the rem scheme comes so let me tell you this rem scheme is one of the most important scheme you think of msme you think of ramp ramp scheme my suggestion prepare this even for the mains because msme's topic is quite critical for the upsc mains as well so do read about them as well okay so now you have the answer so answer is uh, i told you answer is b question number 27 which is about the uh, pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana pradhan mantri j is uh, jan arogya yojana first of all we know it very well the government has announced it so many times our pradhan mantri ji has announced it so many times and this is something we all have we should be proud of india's pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana is not the second largest it is the largest health assurance scheme in the world there is no health scheme no health assurance scheme bigger and larger than what we are covering here in the country so please remember first is wrong what is pradhan mantri jan arogya it is it is the largest health assurance program please read the details first and then we will come back to the main question so pradhan mantri jan arogya largest health care assurance in the world and it is one significant step that india has taken achieving the universal health coverage sustainable development goal number 3 that talks about the universal health best part pradhan mantri jan arogya yojana it covers almost all the secondary care and most of the tertiary care procedures secondary care specialized health procedures your cardiologist your neurologist tertiary care the surgery part the surgeons neurosurgeon cardio surgeon surgery part the specialized super specialized a uh, line of medicine right best part of this what makes it very unique there is absolutely no restriction on the family size because ultimately more than 10 crore households are being covered under this yojana and when you are covering a family like a whole family there is no limit like okay in family there has to be four members five members six member there is no restriction on the family size no restriction age wise no restriction gender wise and that actually make this scheme or make this yojana a really beneficial beneficiary scheme the benefits are portable across the country doesn't matter which part of the country you are you are going to have the same benefits it's a centralized scheme that we have and it covers up to 3 days of pre hospitalization also covers 15 days of 
post hospitalization expenses as well because earlier you, we we used to have lot of uh, health insurance schemes but they were only covering the time of uh, only that duration in which you were hospitalized what about the expenses what about the the money that goes out of your pocket in pre hospitalization and post care but this scheme covers those two components as well that make this scheme really really beneficial for the for the people of india now it is it and and uh, what amount it is giving this scheme aims to cover a health cover of up to 5 lakh rupees per family per year look at this beautiful thing 5 lakh rupees per family per year and that is given to for 10 crore household now i'm not talking about 10 crore people please remember two things are different 10 crore families and if you convert that number it is going to come somewhere around 40% of the most the bottom most people of india the real poor of india 40% population is being covered that makes it the largest healthcare assurance program and all the beneficiaries are to be selected based on socio economic caste census of 2011 and please remember now this is a health insurance so which ministry has to be there ministry of health and that scheme is implemented under ministry of health and to be specific there is a national health authority which we have created for the implementation of the scheme so if you look at the statements now you can clearly figure out the two the two statements are problematic first and third it is not ministry of women child development ministry of health is the case so only one statement is correct so that is very easy question could have been attempted very very easily i hope that 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 is clear to everyone brings us to another government scheme called pradhan mantri swanidhi scheme so already we have discussed one the i remember discussing it with you in the same test series so again the question is about pradhan mantri swanidhi so so far we remember two things one it was about the street vendors yes we were giving if you remember we were giving micro credit micro credit approximately 10000 rupees during the covid time the scheme was started it is about the micro credit like 10000 rupees given to the street vendors but again very careful that scheme this swanidhi scheme is it about the rural street vendors no we clearly have told you many times it is about the urban people the urban street vendors not the rural ones and since the scheme is about urban street vendors do you see any point involving ministry of rural development no it has to be ministry of urban ministry of housing and urban affairs that makes both statements incorrect answer is supposed to be d very easy easily you can attempt because pm swanidhi is something we have done n number of times so now now you know it's a central government scheme giving micro credit rupees like 10000 20000 there are different different brackets the minimum is 10000 10000 20000 50000 and the best part is it is given as collateral free loan collateral free like the the beneficiaries you as a beneficiary you don't really have to give any bank guarantee without any security without any any bank guarantee um, the loans can be given up to 50000 minimum is 10000 goes up to 50000 okay so i hope this is clear to everyone and one one very interesting part um, of this scheme so of the total disbursement so far we have done 44% disbursements under the swanidhi is done uh, for the obcs while sc sts also got approximately 20% of the disbursement okay uh interestingly 60 this is not a not a condition just a just a fact that you can remember question number 29 now this question is with respect to national mission for clean ganga interesting very important question okay my now now this this mission is something which use which was very much in the news if you remember during 2015 16 unfortunately now we have somehow lost the momentum on this mission i personally feel it because uh, there has there has not been any uh, news with respect to the national mission for the clean ganga for many many years but there was a time when there was lot of emphasis was given especially between 2014 and 2019 the first span of modi government we got lots and lots of emphasis on the national mission for clean ganga okay first of all you need to understand basics of this mission and you also should be aware about the ganga river uh, this national ganga river basin authority because that is also being asked you should be aware about that how this 
authority is being registered. There are few things you need to be focused upon first of all. Now please remember one thing. Now we're talking about the national clean uh, national mission on clean Ganga. Okay, this national mission clean Ganga is the implementation wing of the overall national Ganga council that we have created. Okay, one thing. Number two, every action that we are going to do under the clean Ganga program, the implementation arm, which is national Ganga river basin authority, it was constituted under environment protection act. Because cleaning Ganga logically is a part of environment protection, right? So, of course, under this act, it's a very famous act. Under this uh, uh, law, we have started the Clean Ganga mission. And again, we the implementing agency is National Council for Rejuvenation, Protection, Management of River Ganga, which is also known as the National Ganga Council. That, that same thing we have done. But again, the, the actual name of National Ganga Council is National Council for Rejuvenation, Protection, Management of River Ganga. But that name is used. So in short, National Ganga Council is also called. How we have registered this council? How we have done that? So that, that authority is being registered in 2011 as a registered society under the Society Registration Act 1860. As you can very well understand, what objectives we can have, we can think of Mission Clean Ganga. Of course, ensuring river Ganga's pollution abatement, rejuvenating the Ganga basin, maintaining minimum ecological flaws in Ganga, make the whole environment ecosystem of Ganga clean and sustainable, very obvious. But now if you, if you look at the question, now clearly the first statement is not correct. Why? Problem is with the act. We just have learnt cleaning Ganga is actually to be covered under Environment Protection Act. 1986, not any water prevention control of pollution act. I know many, many people, many, many students must have ignored this last particular part. And you really have to be sure. And that actually make the question really, really tough. Why tough? Because obviously this is also not something you can guess that this authority, it is done as a cooperative one or society one. You really cannot guess much. So my suggestion in this kind of question, this was a tough one. You, you, you can skip this question, though the answer is two only, but again, the, it was not easy to guess much. So in this case, you can take a risk, but you can skip also if you are not sure. Since the mission is very old, we sometimes lose our uh, knowledge grip on such topics. And suddenly, if, if that kind of topics pops up, things become difficult for us. Now, the next question we have is with respect to the Pradhan Mantri Vishwakarma Koshal Samman Yojana. Now, this is a very important and interesting scheme that we have to pick up. So, first, let's talk about the Vishwakarma Koshal Samman Yojana and we'll, we'll come back to the question. So, as you can see, this particular scheme, first, let's understand the scheme. The scheme is about Vishwakarma uh, Koshal Yojana, right? So, it is about uplifting the traditional artisans the craftsmen, the craft people of our country, especially those who are operating in, in occupations like blacksmithing, goldsmithing, poultry, carpentry. So this scheme, which is, which is a central sector scheme, fully funded by government of India, is all about uplifting these traditional artisans and craftsmen. Right? And how do we do that? How we are going to uplift them? When I say upliftment means I am going to preserve and integrate their cultural heritage to the formal economy. Also, we want to provide skill upgradation, make relevant, sustainable uh, and suitable training programs available to these traditional artisans. Because, because see, they're traditional, they have traditional ways of doing things. And of course, in this global competitive market, as, as the government must give uh, enough opportunities for these artisans to constantly upgrade their skills. Otherwise, they will become obsolete. And also that's, that's again this program, this scheme is also talking about, that's why it talks about giving better and modern tool to these traditional artisans. And also brand promotion is must. So that's, that's how everything is to be done under the scheme. Now again uh, about the ministry, two things are fine. So please understand if I'm talking about the, uh, these, all these things, which ministry is the nodal ministry? It is ministry of MSMEs because again, Majority of the uh, traditional artisans and carpenters 
they they are being covered by ministry of micro small majority of them are belonging to ms micro and small enterprises okay but again this is a nodal agency but other than this other than this we have other ministries also implementing and contributing to the scheme one is ministry of skill development another is department of financial services which which is under ministry of finance so do not forget to check out them also you may have a question coming separately on that also about the list of ministries involved in this particular program so here you can clearly see my first and third statements are correct but there's problem with the statement number 2 again the problem is with ministry i'm again repeating 90% times you will have this problem where the ministries are not going to be correct so be very careful about the ministries i hope that makes sense so this question uh, i would say it was a medium level question but uh, yeah you can you can you can uh, definitely solve it solve solve it by by decoding certain words so first of all the first word that you need to decode is about the kaushal kaushal is about the skills and vishwakarma that actually vishwakarma who was a vishwakarma if you go back to the history vishwakarma was that great um, you know artist that great artistic work he has done and vishwakarma was the one who actually constructed the gold palace the lanka uh, of uh, ravana as per the mythology so vishwakarma is actually worshiped across all the workers all the artist every construction worker and every other worker they all worship vishwakarma because he is considered to be the legendary god for all these people right so uh, that if you if you have this kind of thing in in your head then of course you can you can actually figure out the purpose and other things so yeah medium level but uh, taking a little bit of risk you can still solve it guys now that brings us to the question number 31 what this question says the question was with respect to the ethanol blended program ebp program very very important star mark very important program into the news so let's try to understand which statements are correct with this with respect to that so first of all let's understand little bit of basics of the ethanol so talking little bit of basics we know ethanol is what ethanol we have learned it in our school days which was c2h5oh that's the chemical formula ethanol is nothing but 99.9% pure alcohol never to be tasted let me tell you never to be tasted or or, or to be drunk so because 99% is like 100% pure alcohol is not just injurious is deadly to the health so normally what alcohol people consume has a percentage of 42% volume to volume and you know what happens with a 42% volume to volume imagine consuming pure alcohol is like it's it's just a pure uh, invitation to death right so ethanol but of course it is a pure alcohol and we use it as a biofuel and that's why that's why as a biofuel we want we have started so called the ethanol blending program means i am going to merge blend certain percentage of ethanol with the regular petrol that we are having and since this is a biofuel and can be naturally processed by fermentation of the sugar by the yeast and this biofuel is something we can manufacture we can we can make in india no we can make in india and petrol is something we don't really have in india so we are all dependent on the imports imagine i am consuming 1 liter of my petrol and 1 liter of petrol costing me rupees 100 why because because uh, for that i re am really importing things from outside imagine in that 1 liter if 20% is my ethanol only 80% is my um, my petrol obviously this cost is going to come down because biofuel is much much cheaper and it has it and and this this can be made in india so we are not dependent on biofuel imports and it is the, it is cheaper as well so that is the best part that's why this ethanol blending program was was launched way back in 2003 that time the target was only 5% blending of the ethanol and right now after achieving success in the program present government has given the target of 20% ethanol blending and that we are supposed to finish uh, by 2025 2026 so if you are if you buy a vehicle these days on on your vehicle they must have mentioned as e20 
Look, you you can just go around and check on your vehicles. Your vehicles must be having a sticker of E20. That says that this vehicle is compatible to E20 uh, ethanol blended fuel. That is one interesting part. Now, which ministry is taking care of this program? It is the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas taking care of this particular program. What are the advantages? So now you can understand why we are we are doing all that ethanol blending. There are so many advantages, not just one, not two. Number one, energy security. Because I am, by mixing my fuels, I am actually diversifying my fuel options. I am also reducing my dependence on fossil fuels. It will also help reduce the import bill of India because I am now going to import less the remaining requirement to be fulfilled by biofuels. Also help doubling the farmer income. Why? Because from where I am going to get the biofuel? The bio, for, for making the biofuel, the biomass is required. And the farmers can actually sell all the farm biomass. They can sell it to the companies who are into the business of ethanol making or biofuel making. No? So that, that can actually get help farmers get extra income. So it's like doubling the farmer income. And this suggestion was actually given by Ashok Dalwai committee. This is important. This committee name is important. After this committee only we got all these targets and boosting of ethanol blending. Again, it can be, and uh, the best part, it is more efficient and it is even cleaner than the fuel. What are the end products of ethanol? Only hydrogen and uh, uh, water. So there is absolutely no problem with the pollutants. It's, it's much cleaner and more efficient fuel than the petrol. Byproducts of the ethanol can be used as fertilizers as well. So you have everything best possible for this scenario. So now if you look at the question, is the target correct? Yes. And be very careful. You have to be careful about the target years. Initially, initially let me tell you, initially the target was 2030. But given the success of our ethanol blending program, government has actually pushed ahead the target by 5 years. Now it is 2025-26. It is fair enough. Third is fair enough. Only problem is statement number 2. Again the ministry. It, ethanol blending is not under ministry of new renewable. It, we have learnt it. It is under the ministry of petroleum and natural gas. So that is the ministry. So here only two are correct. And, and again, there is a hint for you guys. Uh, ultimately, I am talking about ethanol blending petrol. Petrol is still important in, in the blending part. How can it be ministry of new renewable? Because new and renewable is all about the non-fossil fuels. Understand, it is all about the non-fossil fuels. So clearly the blending is still to be under Ministry of Petroleum. So that common sense wise also, the second can be eliminated. But again, the confusion will not get over because I cannot guess, I, I can't guess about the Ashok Dalwai committee if the committee name is correct or not. Again, I, I cannot guess in the exam if my uh, ear is right or wrong. For that, you really need to depend to be dependent on the facts. So read about ethanol blending program. Medium level question could have been attempted for those who have studied it. Otherwise, becomes really tough for those who have because it's a fact based question. Okay, G. Okay, now moving ahead to the question number 32. Question 32 is all about the one station, one product scheme, OSOP. One station, one program. Okay. You need to know certain facts about that and then we'll come back. When you talk about the one station, the key word here is station. Which station? Sir, railway station. If you decode this, it's, it's a railway station scheme, then obviously the ministry becomes clear. It is the Ministry of Railways who has launched this one station, one product scheme. Basically what we are doing, we are trying to promote the vocal for local vision of the government of India. So what we are going to create, this is a very innovative and interesting scheme. The objective is simple. On each railway station, we are going to convert that railway station as a promotional hub where we can showcase all the best local products on that railway platform. For example, I am going from Delhi, I am going to uh, Bhopal, for example. In between, in, in all the stations uh, of UP and uh, 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 MP, in all the stations, because every area, every big area has their own specialized products, right? 
For example, if when I will go when I will go through Agra, I am supposed to get their best pitha. When I will be going through Mathura, I I am I am looking for some of their regional local best products. Right? Every place, every district, every area is known for some of the specialties. Well, that is a very beautiful and innovative idea. What if? What if? Because see, sometimes the train stops for ten minutes. In ten minutes, I am I can't go and explore the city. But what if? the best products of the cities were already on the station on the platform so in 10 minutes or 15 minutes stop at least i have the option to go down and get the best products of that state or or that city for myself or some it can be consumable non consumable that is a different case but are you are you getting the point what if we can convert and transform the railway station as a promotional hub and showcase the local indigenous manufactured products I personally love this idea. It's a beautiful, amazing scheme. But again, be remember, be careful. It's Ministry of Railways who is taking care of the scheme. This was started in two thousand twenty-two, and very interestingly, how it is to be done. Like every applicant, if you want to have your stall on the railway station, you can you you will be allotted a temporary stall for uh, for fifteen days. Uh, for that, you have to deposit one thousand rupees with the railways, and then you will be given the permission. and then you can start your business and depending on your performance and everything the things are to be supported and and what products we are covering under under the scheme every product handicraft articraft textile handloom traditional garment local agriculture produce process semi products everything we are trying to sell and that is a amazing amazing scheme where i am going to get a chance to know my country better i am going to be more connected with other local products of our country but again the second statement is correct here is the problem with ministry not ministry of culture ministries is ministry of railway railways right so first is wrong second is correct answer is to be yeah, which statement is correct so my second statement is correct me uh, easy question very direct straight forward question could have been attempted very easily no twist and turns ministries again see in in today's video so many times we have seen ministries are creating problems and that is the same thing i am telling you from the first test onwards be careful about the ministries next question again be careful the question is about the shreshtha schemes what is shreshtha it's it stands for scheme for residential education for students in high school in targeted areas okay this is the scheme now if you look at the two statements both will look a little bit contradictory to each other if let's say let's say the shreshtha scheme since it is going to target uh the the students in the targeted areas so here what this scheme is all about okay first first oh, chalo i'll first explain then i'll come back first let's explain this then it will confuse it will uh make some confusion for you so when you think of shreshtha scheme now you know the full form right so please remember and keep this full form in your head with the keyword as residential education and the targeted areas basically the shreshtha scheme is about aiming at socio economic upliftment and development of the scheduled caste of india through education are you getting the point targeted areas are those areas which have majority of the sc population and why it is residential education because not just the school we are also providing you residential facilities objective and aim is very simple we want to uplift the socio economic status of the uh, of the scheduled caste and we want to bring development in into the community by a very important factor that is education simple and there will be two modes of doing that number one admissions in the private residential schools and number two government in aids will be released to the ngos and other schools and hostel facilities to be given up to 12th class but what about the ministries because it cannot be ministry of minorities scs are not minorities scs are still not considered as a minority in india there are only two minorities that we have 
वन इज बेस्ड ऑन रिलीजन अदर इज बेस्ड ऑन लैंग्वेज सो कैन यू कंसिडर द एस सी पॉपुलेशन एज ए माइनॉरिटी नो यू कैनॉट कंसिडर दैम एज ए माइनॉरिटी राइट सो क्लियरली कैनॉट बी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ माइनॉरिटी अफेयर्स बिकॉज इट्स अ सोशल कॉज बाय गिविंग बाय बाय सोशो इकोनॉमिक अपलिफ्टमेंट आई एम टारगेटिंग आई एम डूइंग सम सोशल जस्टिस वर्क सो मिनिस्ट्री हैज टू बी मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ सोशल जस्टिस एंड एम्पावरमेंट इज इट मेकिंग सेंस नाउ सो क्लियरली द स्कीम इज अबाउट द स्कड्यूल्ड कास्ट पॉपुलेशन they are not part of minority so how come it can be ministry of minority affairs so second statement being correct first being wrong very simple question easily can be remembered and even understanding the meaning you can clearly figure out because in india when i use the word minority only two minorities are there based on religion based on language nothing based on caste so that was your key hint that that you can solve this question in this particular way another scheme we have is amrit sarovar scheme what we have to remember about the amrit sarovar and be careful in this question you were supposed to figure out which statements are not correct so what is this amrit sarovar let's try to understand so here uh, the mission amrit sarovar we actually have started this scheme uh, in 2022 this amrit sarovar scheme was launched on the national panchayati raj day in 2022 why it is in news right now because this this scheme has now been completed it has completed it has done its objective uh, in august 2023 and it was it was uh, launched as a part of celebration of azadi ka amrit mahotsav that was the 75th uh, year of independence that we were celebrating what this scheme is all about what is this mission amrit sarovar the scheme is very simple to conserve the water for the future mission amrit sarovar sarovar is the water body the 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 meaning of sarovar is nothing but the water body the local water bodies and amrit signifies the water here so we 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 want to conserve the water for the future so how it is to be done now this scheme says it's the scheme's aim is is simple development and rejuvenation of 75 water bodies 75 water bodies in each district of indian state that is how we are going to develop and rejuvenate the 75 water bodies in each district and that's why the word is perfect amrit sarovar and how we are going to do that now this rejuvenation and development of the water bodies is to be done using many other schemes for example manrega the work under manrega is now to be assigned to rejuvenate the water bodies also financial commission grants are to be utilized pradhan mantri kishai krishi sichai yojana sub schemes are to be utilized and all the states own schemes are to be utilized so with a multi policy approach this thing was done and now thankfully and best part we have completed this particular scheme the question says which statement is not correct but here both statements are correct so answer is supposed to be d neither one nor two because both statements are correct easy question simple straight forward easy to attempt if you have read about it okay next is about the the mp lad scheme very very important scheme that we have to discuss and look at the look at the statement six statements were there but the scheme is something which is absolutely important this scheme is something you have to learn and you have to revise for sure because we already have got many questions i think few years back also we got questions on mp lad and now time and again there is every time a possibility mp lad scheme can come first we'll talk about the detail we'll come back becomes easy for us to understand why some statements were wrong what is the meaning of mp lad scheme first of all it stands for member of parliament uh uh local area development scheme lad is local area development scheme so as the name is saying everything means somehow there is a relation between local area development and the member of parliament of that area right that is the scheme now this scheme is a central sector scheme all funding to be done by government of india and this is not a new concept since 1993 94 we have started this particular scheme that is first thing you have to remember as i am saying here the member of parliament is supposed to do the local area development for that purpose under the scheme 
every member of parliament is entitled to get some funds. How much fund? 5 crore rupees every year is given to the member of parliament. Now that member of parliament can be elected one or the nominated one. We'll come on to that later. But first understand this part. So member of uh, parliament is going to get this 5 crore rupees. But please understand, it is, it is not uh, uh, that the member of parliament himself or herself is going to get involved. The role of the MP is just to recommend the work, what kind of work is to be done and that is based on the local needs of the, the area. The purpose is, the, or the general uh, purpose is, that at least some durable assets are to be created under this particular scheme. And depending on the needs of the local people, the member of parliament has a work to recommend, okay, this work is to be done under the MPLAD scheme. Then that request goes to the district authorities, like district collector. Once that request is received by district collector, then he, his or her work is to sanction the eligibility of the work. Okay, fine, this can be done. Yes, it can be done. And also to select the implementing agency who is going to be responsible for the implementation of the scheme. Are you getting my point? So, member of parliament's job is to recommend the nature of the work, this work to be done, and then rest of the things are to be done by the district authorities. Please remember that. Which ministry is responsible? Which ministry has formulated this policy? We have Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, which is called the MOSP. This is the ministry who is responsible for all this scheme and giving 5 crore rupees and that too in a non-lapsable manner. Please understand, I'm saying 5 crore rupees every year. This amount is non-lapsable, means if one MP is not able to use all the fund of 5 crore rupees, some portion is left can be utilized next year. It is not going to be lapsed. It can be used next year. It can be added to the next credit. No problem at all. I think that that point is clear. Now, keyword is very important. MP is only has a recommendary nature of the work. And somewhere that the, the uh, main objective is to create some durable community assets. Du durable community assets means some kind of project, some kind of asset, some kind of infrastructure which is going to solve the drinking water problem or education or public health or sanitation or road. These kind of projects are mainly taken care under the MPLAD scheme. So now you remember the ministry is MOSP, very important. Every year 5 crore rupees to be given, non-lapsable I told you. And there is one more condition, interesting condition. Of all the money out of 5 crore, all the money that is going to be spent under the scheme, Every MP has to make sure at least 15% work is recommended for the sake of uh, for, for uh, that kind of work that is going to serve the scheduled caste community. 7.5% of the total work that was recommended by MP must be serving the purpose of ST community. Understood? This is a very interesting thing. And, and some, some here, somewhere this is almost uh, equal to the kind of you know, a population that they have. So almost based on the representation, almost both based on their reservation, this is the nature of work that needs to be kind of reserved, you can say, or uh, targeted for these communities. Now, interestingly, now I told you that every, every member of parliament is to do that. Uh, now, that member of parliament can be Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha. If you are a Lok Sabha MP, of course you have you have to recommend the work within your own constituency. If you are a Rajya Sabha member, then of course you have this privilege of recommending the work in the entire state from which you are the Rajya Sabha member. If you are a nominated MP, because being nominated member, member of parliament, you don't have any particular constituency, then you have this privilege that you can choose the work anywhere in India. You can actually pick up the task anywhere in India if you are a nominated one. Okay? If you know all these things, so straight away you can jump to the question and there out of six you can straight away tell me, sir, only four statements are correct. I can eliminate this big figure because in MP land it is not 10 crore rupees, it is 5 crore rupees per parliament per year. So my fourth is incorrect. And then it says Ministry of Finance 
do we have any involvement of this ministry again the problem is with ministry this is fourth or fifth question today out of 15 so far that we have got some problem with the ministry so very careful hint for all of you it is the ministry of statistics and program implementation MOSP is the one so but and remaining all statements are correct so here uh, the question I would say the question was a, was an easy one why because every statement is very simple statement very straightforward question something that you all are supposed to read under the MP lab. so this is purely fact based question very easy very simple statements and here the right answer is supposed to be only four I hope everyone has got this uh, got this uh, answer okay next question 36 is one of my favorite and one of UPSC favorite also so you have got some matches some pairs to be matched so here on left side the schemes were given on the right side ministries you have to figure out Swadesh Darshan now again we'll come back to the main things but what this Swadesh Darshan is Swadesh Darshan is about uh, exploring your own country and when you are exploring your own country when you are sightseeing your own country of course it is supposed to be Ministry of T uh, Tourism right so very simple as a hint I can solve this question but if you look at the statement number four now this statement is about Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sichai Yojana Krishi Sinchai Sichai is what irrigation which ministry best you can think of Ministry of Jal Shakti so first and fourth is something which can I which I can straight away tell okay these two are going to be solved with my logic but then you have problem with statement number uh, with the second and the fourth one because palna palna is what like I can tell you I know the scheme but how a common student can think about it first try to understand that so uh, uh, Swadesh Darshan we already have done it is under Ministry of Tourism I told you it is all about developing the theme based sur tourist circuits in, in, in our country Swadesh Darshan is 100% centrally funded scheme and then also the funding can be done under the corporate social responsibility initiatives the second was the Palna scheme basically we have got the national crutch scheme earlier and now the national crutch scheme is being reorganized and renamed as the Palna scheme under the Samarth, Samarthya or the Mission Shakti so what exactly we are doing so here the, the, the plan is very simple uh, it is it is about uh, providing the crash facilities for those uh, mothers who are working so as to get their children safe and sound at, at a place government uh, oriented place as a crash facilities as a daycare facilities we have started this Palna scheme so which ministry logically crash facilities are for children right and supporting the working women so obviously the best ministry I can think of is Ministry of Women and Child Development and then you have the Ajay scheme Ajay what what is the what is the full form of the scheme Ajay so Ajay is a very important scheme if you see and this particular scheme uh, if you go by the full form it, it talks about the um, Anusuchit Jati Abhyude Yojana so Ajay scheme full form is Anusuchit Jati Abhyude Yojana which are Anusuchit Jatis the scheduled caste communities so the scheduled so this scheme Ajay scheme is about upliftment of the SC communities 100% central sponsored central sponsored means funding to be divided by central and state both because it's a social matter so which ministry if I'm if I'm uplifting the SC communities which ministry I'm targeting about I'm talking about Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment right this is important and then we have Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sachai which is central sponsored again and this is uh, within the Ministry of Jal Shakti because in Krishi Sichai, I'm talking about enhancing the physical access to water on the farm, expanding the cultival, cultivable areas, improving on farm water use efficiencies. So best ministry I can think of is Ministry of Jal Shakti. Very, very important, right? So here if you see, barring the exception of one and two, uh, one and four, these two are correct. But actually these two are being inter-exchange. So Ajay is about social justice because it talks about SC upliftment and Palna is the crutch mission so has to be Ministry of Women Child Development. So very careful and most of the times like 90% of the time I can tell you the, uh, the schemes are actually being interchanged. So don't just look at the column in front of the scheme also look up and down so that you can understand that okay there, there has been some inter exchange which is done by the question paper right. So here only two statements are correct 
medium level not that difficult easy schemes simple schemes are there only you need to know some of their basic things and rest of the things can be done so answer is only two that is b brings us to the question number 37 that is with respect to election commission of india state forward certain things i need to for, uh, i need to talk we all know election commission of india and and do expect some question coming uh, uh, with respect to election this year because this is our election year no so do expect questions coming from the election or somehow related to election commission guys already there has been so many news and controversies about uh, around the election commission so do prepare it well we all know one thing for sure election commission is a constitutional body because we know under the article 324 election commission is being mentioned in the constitution so then it says the first statement says autonomous fine is it statutory authority absolutely not it's a constitutional authority article 324 defines everything about the election commission and 324 says that uh, and and again there is one one more problem now the question says the first statement is wrong we already have figured out it is not statutory okay fine we know that in our election commission of india it's a three member body where we have one chief election commissioner and then we have two election commissioner that is the structure it's a three member body okay recently you have seen in the news the way election commission uh, election commissioners were selected and every controversy around it the question says that 324 defines the legislative process to appoint the chief election commission and election commissioner that is not true in our constitution it is only it is only said there has to be election commission of india with election commission chief election commissioner and election commissioners but the constitution has not defined the process how that appointment is to be done that is actually left out to the best of the of the executive they have not defined the process if this would have been the case there would be more transparency there would be even better way of selecting and electing the candidates so first and second both are incorrect now please look at the third one the third statement says the prime minister appoint the commission on the recommendation of selection committee just apply your logic election commission has the has the most critical task to do free and fair elections the major work is free and fair elections do you think if the prime minister has the power to appoint the election commission don't you think there are chances of having some kind of biasness the prime minister is always going to appoint his own favorite guy and then the government may have undue favor or may have got some benefit from that so do you think if that would be the case do you think free fair election are possible in the country absolutely no so prime minister appointment is not the right thing to do so election commission is actually appointed by president all the members of chief election and other so it is it is to be done by the president of india and president of india also does not do it on its own the president of india appoint the election commission members based on a selection committee and that selection committee that committee consists of prime minister leader of opposition or leader of the oppo uh, largest opposition party and then uh, as per the latest amendment by the government then you got a third member as the union minister any union minister which is appointed by prime minister now obviously every anybody can understand this obviously even before getting to, to the name you know if you have a prime minister and and his own minister there is always going to be one is to one ratio you can't you can't have a minister opposing or going against the prime minister right so already it's, it's a done deal kind of thing already it's a done deal right uh, but yeah that is the case so we have a selection committee so every name which is which is selected as two is to one finally that becomes the that name is given to the president and president then appoint that person so at least my first three statements are absolutely wrong and i have done the three as wrong on all based on the common sense yeah fourth is correct members of the commission can't be reappointed and that is another way we are ensuring the impartiality unbiasedness of the election commission because any member should not be uh, you know having this feeling of getting reappointed again and again it's a one one time job to be done and uh, for that purpose they are not dependent on uh, 
uh, anything. So only one is statement is correct. All three are wrong. I do not need any special logic. I don't need anything special about to know to solve this question. Again, very smartly, very with the presence of mind, the things can be solved here. Question was tough, but you can solve it with presence of mind. Every question is not difficult. Yeah, question is not difficult. Sometimes you really have to be in your presence of mind zone. That's it. Next question is from the world history. The world history question says about the American Civil War. Very, very famous event of the world history that we have. And we know the American Civil War was basically between the northern states and the southern states. And the major issue behind the American Civil War, which started 1861, ended 1865. The major issue was the issue of slavery because the southern states, they were in favor of you know, legalizing the slavery because ultimately these slaves were helping the southern states in their agriculture work because southern states were primarily agricultural. Northern states, they were opposing the slavery. They, should, they, they, they used to say the slavery system is not good and this is because, because see, northern uh, states don't really wanted free slaves because they were more industrialized. So they made up the question as a basic human right. Slavery is not uh, a part of human right and slavery is against the humanity. All these kind of things were made by Northern states. So of course, the major issue, the major problem behind the American Civil War was the North-South divide on the issue of slavery. Northern states more industrialized, Southern more primarily agriculture. So yeah, first and second statements are absolutely correct. There is problem with the statement number three. It is absolutely fine that civil war ended 1865, yes, where southern states finally merged again to the union of uh, union um, um, of uh, federation of states of the US and again the US become the United States of America. And after that, some states passed the black codes, but black codes are not something good. When some of the states, after the ending of the civil war, when some of the states, especially the southern states, when they passed the black codes, black codes were not to provide rights to the black people, but black codes were rather to limit the rights of the black people, to limit their rights, to, to limit, okay, only this kind of occupation, this black person can do. Okay, you can't resign from the post. There are like, they, like the black codes were actually a regressive measure. In reality, the real equality in the United States of America was not established after the civil war end. It was in 1964 or something where we got that movement done by Martin uh, Jr., uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Then the black people got the equal rights. So black courts were not to provide the right but to limit the rights of the black people. So first, second correct, third is incorrect. So right answer has to be two. This question was a medium question, but could have been attempted with the basic knowledge of world history. You can solve it very simple and very easy things. Okay. Okay. Question number 39 we have is about Indian passports. Very interesting question, guys. Very uh, Now, this is something that every one of you can answer based on your own experience. How? Let's try to understand. All you have to do is to keep your passport or in your hand. That's it. My simple thing is, just keep your passport in front of you and you can solve this question. It's a practical, it's, it's probably the most practical question that you come across in the test series. Indian passports is a proof of address as well as citizenship. Of course, your passport, we use passport uh, as, a, as a document of address proof also. no? And, we, you, and this is also, the passport is all about the citizenship. So yes, both are absolutely correct. If you look at the passport, which which color which color passport most of most of us has, we have the blue color passport because we are normal regular people. We are not government officials or we are not diplomats, right? So, official official passport is in blue color. No, you and me are not officials. Official passports are in white color. The diplomatic, all the bureaucrats, all the diplomats. All the member of parliaments they get the uh, passport as a maroon color passport. I would like to I would like to show here to you guys. Look at the three types of Indian passports. So you and me we all are having this regular P type passport. This is what we we have. 
but for all the officials we have the white one diplomatic passports are the maroon one okay remember this this few facts so and it is also mentioned here the ordinary the blue ones are called the p type s type is the official passports and the d type is the diplomatic passport so you you never know you may have a question based on these demarcations and where it is said that proof of address and citizenship please remember this case supreme court in a very legendary case satwan singh sahani in 1967 there the supreme court has clearly mentioned that every citizen has a right to passport and after that judgment only indian passport act 1967 was passed and it was made clear that citizen that this uh, passport is your proof of address and a proof of citizenship both things are to be remembered and remember one more thing i'm sure if you have ever seen the passport carefully your passport actually has a note from president of india and that note says it because of that note only it it's a safe passage to indian citizens which language you have on the passport language allowed on the passport is hindi as well as english only two languages are to be there english and hindi on your passport now if you go back to the question i'm sure you can solve it with very uh, normal way so look at the statement number 4 first it says only english language allowed in indian passport that is not the case hindi is uh, is what we speak on a broader scale so it is not the english we also have hindi as the language on passport so makes four as wrong one even second statement is wrong because official ones are not blue colors official one the s type you have seen they have the white color passports yeah so yeah first and third being correct second third second fourth being wrong only two is the answer uh this question was an easy one why i'm telling you that but why i'm telling you easy one because this is most practical we all have seen passports we don't need book we don't need special knowledge we all we need is a special observation if you have ever carefully seen your passport then you can easily give the answer of this question the last one we have the last question number 40 is with respect to the electronic voting machines the evm the very much talk in the town these days because elections are coming and every probability around evm is in the air now very interestingly let's first try to get certain interesting things about the evm that you should be aware of guys the evms were first used in kerala but not at a state election first times evms were used only in the by elections and that too in the paravur assembly constituency and way back in 1982 so remember this is a very interesting fact about the evm now when certain doubts were raised and certain questions were raised on the evm so to check to maintain the authenticity of the electronic voting machines another system was added to the evm which we all call as vv pat which is a very favor which is a, a, a voter verifiable paper audit trail where after you uh, press the blue button on the evm when, whenever you register your vote after registering the vote an print form of the vote is being printed by the vv pat machine which is attached just adj adjacent to the evms first time this vv pat concept was was uh, you know was brought in 2011 and then in 2013 there was another by election in nagaland there we have first time used and demonstrated how the vv pat can work please remember all the experiments were done in the by elections not like a full fledged election or something so i want to know when was the first lok sabha election that was conducted by evm can you tell me when for the first time evms were used at a full fledged level in lok sabha elections can you tell me if you know the answer tell me in the comment section box and please remember one interesting thing evm voting machine does not permit more than 4 votes per minute and this is something i only know today by when i was reading this statement and it's a very interesting thing look at that i mean sometimes there is always a, a fear of booth capturing you know what if if somebody captures a booth and continuously put keep on putting the vote 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 you know in less than 1 minute you can you can poll 100 votes but that is not the case with the evm evm is designed in such a way only 4 votes can be registered in 1 minute because that is that but what what we believe 
at least 15 seconds it takes for anybody to come and cast their vote and go and next person will come. So at least 4 minutes. Never ever more than 4 votes can be registered. Um, uh, you know, uh, that is very interesting case that we have. And please remember one thing. So whenever, uh, whenever, if this is my election, if this is my EVM, let's say, and very close to EVM, there is a VVPAT machine which is being attached. This is how the VVPAT machines are. It's like a box that we have. And on the box, there is a, there is a screen. So whenever you, you poll your vote, um, you know, so that paper audit, paper trail is displayed and you can see, all, but uh, initially before 2016, that light dot that light is to be opened for 15 seconds means for 15 seconds you can see clearly you can see your vote but after 2016 i don't know why but and that makes the things very suspicious why election commission has now reduced the time of seeing the paper audit in the vv pad now it is being reduced just to 7 seconds so now only you get 7 seconds to see if the vote is casted correctly or not and also the election commission of India, there used to be the glass used to be transparent, but now they have made it little, little bit opaque with the black color that actually makes it challenging to, to, for the voter to see if that paper audit is correct or not. So very interesting. And that's why everyone is talking about the EVM these days, right? So now if you go back to the question, so you can easily figure out some statements wrong here. Like for example, it says first time EVM used in Tamil Nadu. No, it was the by-election in Kerala and that was 1982. So first statement wrong. Fourth is also wrong. Of course that paper is not visible for 45 seconds. As per the new rules it is only for the 7 seconds I told you. So that makes these two incorrect. So second statement is correct and yeah third is also correct. The EVM voting does not permit votes. Four votes per minute more than that. So yes in this case my own answer is only two. Uh, the question was I would say it was a, it was a medium level question. Because already the topic of the EVM is so much in circulation, you're supposed to be ready with this kind of question and then you can easily attempt it or at least take a risk because EVM is very popular topic that, that is there in uh, these days which is happening. So I really hope guys you have enjoyed the entire video, you have learned a lot of things from it. Tell me your favorite part, tell me the feedback of this video, how you have enjoyed it, what what new things you have learned from this video. I'm really curious to know if my contribution, contribution uh, is making some difference in your UPSC preparation. If you think that this test series has contributed uh, to your preparation and if you think that our videos has boosted your confidence, then please hit a like button on our video and don't forget to check out the test series which is the link is given in the description. See you guys in part number three very, very soon. Take care. God bless you. Enjoy and best of luck for your upcoming exams 2024. Jai Hind.